So that's a little bit on zoos finished. Again, you'll have your own opinion on zoos, but I think even if you're going to be a, a large animal vet or a small animal vet, it's good to have a think, think about these things and have an opinion that's based on real uh, facts and real argument. And of course, that might evolve over, over time as well. But uh, I want to talk a bit about environmental ethics, because again, this is another sort of whole area that has an animal, has an animal element to it, where you could argue that there's kind of spheres of interests um, which are related to me, so I imagine me or you in the middle there. You could argue that you might be interested in, you might have duties towards your family first and foremost, that's why they're nearest to you. And it's kind of like layers of an onion going out, so you say, okay, your compatriots, you've got duties, like that. maybe your classmates or other students here at the vet school, or you could even say people that live in this country. Then you've got duties to all humans, not to kill them and things like that, uh, ideally, anyway. Um, then you might say, I, I think I've got duties next to all, all mammals. Like, this is just examples. You could say something else. You could say all animals, if you liked, or all sentient animals you might put there. Then all living things. You might say, I've got some duties to all living things. And then even I've got duties to the world in the sense of non-living things like rivers and mountains and things. So this idea that we've got the most to care about the nearest to us, but we still have some care or some duties towards these other entities which are less directly relevant to us but still have value, have, still have moral value. So we could talk about a human-centred ethics. This would be the contractarian position that showed that only humans are involved in ethics. It's a, a position that some people have, that ethics is only about humans and what humans do to each other and the rest is, is not morally relevant. That would be the idea that animals have no moral status. Or we talked a bit about a sentient based ethics in the first lecture, or the first talk, only sentient animals have intrinsic worth. So you say, I care about humans and I care about sentient animals because they can suffer. I'm not too worried about jellyfish or snails if I don't think they're sentient, but I'm, I care about chimps and cats and cows and things. And then you could say, okay, I actually care about everything that's alive. All living things have some kind of intrinsic moral worth. So even if it's not sentient, there's something morally wrong about destroying an animal. Not because it can suffer, but because there's something else wrong about that, about destroying life. And that would include, of include like cutting down a tree, of course. It's a living thing. Maybe there's something wrong with cutting a tree down. Some sort of reverence for life. And could you argue that plants have interests or welfare? I don't think it's hard to argue for welfare, but you could argue that a, a, a tree has an interest in not being cut down, even though it can't suffer as such. I think welfare is a push for them, because welfare is related to experiences for me anyway. And then you can have, finally have this environmental centred ethics where not just individuals but wholes count. So whole ecosystems, whole river systems, whole um, food webs, that sort of thing. Some sort of respect for biodiversity would be in there. Preserving the integrity, stability and beauty of the biotic community. And this will include non-living things to some extent, like you know, rivers and things. So as again, you may have some, some duties to all these in your mind or you may want to stop at a certain point, that's, your, that's up to you. But ecocentric ethics goes all the way. And it's in fact not really interested in individuals, it's only interested in these holes. And the holes will be put first over the individuals to some extent. So how does, what's this environment-centred environment -centred ethics in, in animals? What, what's the link there? Well, there is obviously a link because concern for the animals and the environment have much in common because animals, of course, are part of the environment. So when you think about something like whaling, which is a very emotive thing and a lot of people are concerned about that. It's not so common as it was, but it still does happen. Um, why might you object to whaling? Well, you might object to it because um, I'm concerned about the effect it has on the environment, that there's endangered species and there's, there's part of a food web and, you know, we're taking a sort of big animal out of the food web and, and it's an endangered species as well. Or you might say, Do you know, I think whaling is bad because this, this whale's going to suffer quite a lot because whales are really actually quite hard to kill and they have to use explosives and it's all pretty nasty. Or you could, of course, object for both reasons. But that would be an example of one where you could have quite separate reasons for, for objecting almost. So, but there are also some differences between this ecocentric ethics and animal ethics, as we would understand it, they're, they're interested in sentient animals. Because unlike animal ethics, ecocentric ethics shows little concern for captive animals. We are always concerned about farmed animals and you know, animals in labs and things. That wouldn't really be a concern for the ecocentric position. It's only interested in the natural environment. So captive animals are not really involved. Um, it's also considered a bit more than just sentient animals. So mo for most people in animal ethics, sentience is the basis for moral consideration. In an ecocentric ethics, obviously, rivers and, and forests and, and things count as well. 
And with animal ethics, we're, talk, we're talking about pain and death and ways of suffering and ways of being harmed, the, suffer, the, the harm of death and so on. Again, for ecocentric ethics, that might be seen as part of the process essential for, for life and be accepted quite readily. Pain is part of life and death is part of life. And finally, ecocentric ethics is more concerned with systems or structures than individuals. So it's interested in a species, not the individual polar bear in the zoo. It's interested in the polar bear species. So it's this wider, wider, kind of, uh, con wider concern. And that can actually be at odds with animal ethics sometimes. So you can think of examples where you might go and shoot some feral goats to protect a rare plant that's growing in an area. That's a, there's only one area left where this plant grows and some feral goats have got in there and they're eating it, then the ecocentric view would be absolutely shoot those goats <laughs> and save that species of plant, even though the, obviously the goats are sentient and the plants are not. Also, something like this, where you put an animal, this is various kind of programmes where they put animals um, in transportation and they take them to perhaps a new island to try and set up a new population of you know, a particular species to give it a chance to, to re-establish, for example, in a pristine environment, then the animal in this box is not probably having a particularly good time. It's been captured, it's been it's a wild animal. It might be sedated or something, but either way, it's been handled, it's been harmed, you could say. Um, and that's been done for the greater good, for the good of the species. So the individual's not being um, catered for particularly. And again, the big example of this is captive breeding programmes in zoos, where the needs of the individual animals in the zoos are not always being met potentially, but the important thing is we're keeping animals alive and we're breeding from them. And eventually, of course, ideally, you know, releasing them into the wild. But for, for long periods and for large numbers of animals, it is a captive situation that they're in, which may not meet all their needs. Can we even talk about population welfare? Can we apply the concept of welfare to a population? If, we can't, if it's not about individuals, it's about wholes. Can we talk about that? Well, biodiversity could be a kind of way of saying how, how the welfare of this population within the species or between the species would be an interesting way of looking at it and also how diverse is the ecosystem, for example. That's how healthy is this ecosystem, you could say. Also, how much resources are there? Are there you know, unrestricted home ranges? Is there a possibility for migration? These are all ways of looking at a, a, an area and going, how healthy is this population? How healthy is this ecosystem? And even the quality of resources, for example, is there more than one kind of food that this animal can eat? There's only one kind and things like that could be, could be a way of looking at the population welfare. And that may be very important, um, which part of the population, which part of the system do we have to put resources into to improve it and so on. And this of course is the stuff of wildlife management and conservation programmes. So the welfare of wild animals I alluded to earlier and um, just to acknowledge that basically it's, it's not good really. <laughs> um, I'm sure you've seen wildlife programmes where you've thought God somebody should just go and put that animal out of its misery. Um, and I know that wildlife cameramen often have these moral dilemmas of whether they leave what they're filming, whether they step in. Um, so, just to make the point that we shouldn't necessarily hold up this natural uh, or wild welfare as the benchmark for captive animal welfare, because actually we can often do better than wild animal welfare, because we can make sure they're not hungry and we can make sure they're not in pain and so on, or they're in thermal comfort and things like that. So, we're not trying to be completely natural, because if we're being completely natural, we'd make sure all our animals were in pain occasionally and hungry and cold and predated and all these things that happen to wild animals. What should we do about wild animal welfare, if anything? Should we do nothing? Well, there's certainly some strong arguments against doing anything, against treating wildlife, against intervening. It's, a, it's such a big problem, it's absurd to even start. It's millions of animals, huge numbers of welfare issues that it's just, it's nothing to do with us and it's absurd to begin. Also, we might not know what to do for some animals. You know, we might not know how to, to make a difference. And we might have there might be consequences of what we do that are not predictable, that we suddenly change a balance in, in, in a food web or something that if we protect prey, then we affect the predator. If we protect the predator, we affect the prey. And there's these interlinked interests in these systems. And of course, we're interfering with natural selection where animals do die and animals are outcompeted by other animals and that's part of the process. And of course, as soon as we bring any animal into, into captivity, we're going to be stressing it, usually. If it's a wild animal, that's going to be difficult to achieve without some welfare compromise. And when we even when we do, which we'll look at in a minute, we're not, we don't know, always know how good the survival rate is for these things and whether it's, it's worth doing, even just for the sake of survival. 
arguments to intervene. We can enhance our knowledge of, of animals and, and how they work and you know, medically and so on and behaviourally even. We can enhance respect for the environment by saying, no, you know, we, should, we care about the environment, animals are part of the environment, we should care about animals, we should do something. We could be successful, of course, and improve welfare, at least to some animals. And of course, there might be an argument for particularly trying to treat endangered species. So you won't intervene normally, but if it's endangered, you'll intervene to try and improve survival for endangered species. And one of the biggest arguments, and we'll see this in a minute, is compensating for human acts. So a lot of what we see, say you hit an animal with your car, then you, it wouldn't be injured if you didn't hit it with your car. <laughs> so maybe you should take it to the Wildlife Rehabilitation Centre because it's your fault in that sense. And that's one of the strongest arguments for, for um, intervening. Another argument would be sort of stewardship idea. So we can treat animals where we've been responsible only. So let's compensate for our own acts when we can and just try to avoid creating new problems for wild animals. Try to leave them alone, essentially. And that would be a kind of reasonable thing to do. Of course, so you could argue we've actually interfered everywhere already through global climate change. But that being said, ideally we'd want to maybe intervene where we've been responsible and, and leave them alone otherwise. So why might we want to rehabilitate wildlife? So we're going to the more technical side of just actually wildlife rehabilitation centre. Well, again, we can improve animal welfare, particularly when we've been the reason for the welfare compromise initially. Research can be done in these, these kind of places, both into how to rehabilitate better for the next time, and also feeding back into care for animals in zoos. And of course, the fundamental biology of the animals could be interesting to us as well. Conserve endangered species, as I said, and some of these rehabilitation places have pub the public going in. Again, some of the, the Scottish Sea Life Centres that, that rehabilitate seals, you can go and see the seals um, that are being rehabilitated and people like to go and see them and they think it's good work that's going on and they, and they, can, they, you know, they contribute financially and so on. And again, and also saying this, this seal had to be rehabilitated because it was caught in a net or it was hit by a propeller or whatever and explaining some of the impacts that people are having or the humans are having on these populations as well. So it could be a good educational vehicle. So what is rehabilitation? Well, I suppose it's an attempt to turn the animal to full health would be the ideal, the full, full vigour. Although some would say it's good enough to attempt to return it to a reasonably functional condition. Now, if it's just the second one here, then that's perhaps more concerning because if it's only reasonably functional, perhaps it can't survive in the wild. And that means it has to spend the rest of its time in captivity, which you may or may not agree with whether that's a good thing for it. Um, and there's a different, there's a different goals with different ethical implications. And again, many programmes are a bit vague about what they're trying to achieve. Um, although some do have strict rules that if, they can't, if the animal won't survive in the wild, then they don't continue, because that, but that's the goal. And no animals will be kept in captivity long term. And also within the whole rehabilitation community, there's a general agreement that the health of the wild population is more important than the individual. So it is a more ecocentric viewpoint. If the animal had a disease that could be given to the population, they wouldn't release it again. They would to preserve the wild population over the, the, the welfare or the, the life of that individual. So it's very much, a, again, the wild population they're trying to serve through serving these individual animals. Just a wee success story about a porpoise, um, a stranding, a lot of cetacean and, and um, you know, seals, pinnipeds, uh, rehabilitation, and it's, a, and it's a nice data, which is why I've chosen it, really. Um, this yeah, young male harbour porpoise was stranded in America in North Carolina. It was rehabilitated for 10 months at the National Aquarium. So again, these aquariums could also have a role in rehabilitation, apart from just the entertainment angle we looked at earlier. It was released very far north of its visual site, which is where it shouldn't have been. And then it was tracked with a satellite tag, which again, now we can do. We can track these animals, which is great. It remained uh, where, where it was released, and then it moved south again, back to where it was originally stranded. So it must have been something attractive about that place, even though it was out of its normal range. Um, but then the tag failed. So they don't know what happened next, but it seemed it was thriving, which is good, and that's a really nice story. Although it was in for 10 months, which is a long time. Um, and 10 months is, you know, it's quite a long period to be in captivity for a wild animal. If you actually look at the numbers, it's a nice paper that I found looking at rehabilitation cases of, of pinnipeds, that's seals and sea lions and cetaceans, obviously whales and dolphins, um, over a, a sort of 10 year period. Just because I couldn't find data on other species, so I thought I'd go with this one. And Live stranding, dead stranding, and stranding obviously applies to animals because they get stuck on the beach, admitted for rehab and released. And the numbers for pinnipeds are, are quite good. I mean, half of them that are admitted get released, so, but it's only half. 
but that's quite not a bad number. But if you look at the cetaceans, the majority of course are dead stranded, so there's no help that can be given. And even the ones that are live stranded, only 23 were admitted for rehab and only four in, in 10 years were released. So that would kind of argue that this is not a particularly helpful or not a particularly effective thing. We're not very good at it, <laughs> whatever we're doing for cetaceans. So perhaps the effort should be more in, in the pinnipeds. So just to give you an idea of the numbers, you know, we, this is across different states of the USA, not the whole USA. And then we might rehabilitate them, we've got to release the animal. There's some issues around release. How should we do that? Is it better to take it a long distance into perhaps a more suitable range? It's what they did for that porpoise. Or release it where you found it. And there's an, always a kind of push-pull, because often animals are found in the wrong place. That's often why they're in distress, because they're in, in the wrong place. Again, if we release them, we don't know whether they've got any reproductive potential, which could be important if we're thinking about the population. Um, also, there's a risk of abnormal behaviour in the wild. So there's been cases, certainly, of, of, of sea lions and things becoming nuisance animals, learning that humans give them fish and going up to boats and harbours and, and trying to get fish or trying to, you know, not understand why people, no one's giving them fish because they've been fed like that for months in a, in a rehabilitation centre. Can they actually forage successfully once released? Maybe they're just being a bit lazy, or maybe they really are struggling to find food. And obviously a slow death from malnutrition is, is a big welfare concern. And again, we just don't really know how well these do. You know, there's a lot of limited success perhaps, and we hear about successes, but not the failures, because we don't know the outcomes. So it's, it's not as, even if we get as far as releasing, which you saw was quite a small number, even then there are some issues around that and whether it's successful. And of course, everyone remembers this, do you remember this whale that swam at the Thames? And everyone in the public really got behind it and really wanted to save it. And of course, it died anyway because it was ill and it shouldn't even have been there. It obviously got disorientated and swam up a freshwater river, which is not what, what whales should do. So these cases are quite high profile. And again, people really like whales and kind of give it names and things and, and become attached to it. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult. And again, the public will, will value quantity of life, keep the animal alive at all costs sometimes over welfare when the animal will be better off being put to sleep.